evening and thank you for joining us for Creme 2 News at 5 tonight. I'm Mark Hanrahan. It's good to have you here. I'm Whitney Ward. The CDC has released new guidance for mask wearing as the number of new COVID infections has dropped by 65% in the past two weeks. The CDC says it is now switching to a new metric to determine when face masks are recommended in indoor public settings, which all depends on COVID case counts, hospitalizations and hospital capacity. We're in a stronger place today as a nation with more tools to protect ourselves and our communities from COVID-19. The administration's newest roadmap says COVID-19 is here to stay, but may join the ranks of other viruses like the seasonal flu continuing to threaten lives, but without throwing the nation into crisis. Now we did reach out to the governor's office to see how this could affect our statewide mask guidance, which is in place until this spring. A representative with the governor's office told us we have not had a chance to review the new guidance. Once that happens, there will be a broader discussion with the governor's office and the Department of Health about its implications for our state. New tonight, the Colville School Board voted to reverse course on its decision to make masks optional, which was in violation of the state mask mandate. So starting Monday, masks will again be required for students and staff. Creme 2's Cody Proctor is joining us now to give more details about, about what went into that decision. Cody? Well, Mark and Whitney, today's decision came just days after the school district decided to make masks optional. And a very big part of that decision came down to money. According to Conville School District Superintendent Steve Fisk, violations of the mandate could be from $100 to $7,000 per violation. According to him, the minimum fine potential at $100 per day per violation could be about $153,000. The maximum could be over $10 million. Fisk also reported to the board that labor and industry could do surprise inspections at any time. The potential significant impacts from fines and violations could financially cripple our school district for many years to come. Today's decision also comes one day after Kettle Falls voted to make masks required again for schools in the region. Superintendent Fisk says going virtual for the remainder of the indoor mask mandate was also considered, as well as taking several weeks off from school and going back after the mandate expired. However, he reported the move would extend the end of the school year. Masks will be required for all staff, students and visitors starting this Monday, and it'll stay in effect through March 18th, the Friday before the state's indoor mask mandate ends. Also at today's meeting, Superintendent Fisk put in his resignation for professional and personal reasons. The board accepted his resignation. In the newsroom, Cody Proctor, Creme 2 News. Thank you, Cody. And over in Kettle Falls, the school district has voted to make masks required again as well for schools across the region. That's coming, of course, 11 days after the board voted to make them optional. The move was in violation of the Washington State mask mandate, which, as it turns out, again, is set to be lifted on March 21st. The school district closed yesterday to review their decision to drop the mask requirement. The district's HR manager says the decision follows a conversation with the Washington State Department of Labor and Industries regarding an investigation into the district. District. The prospect of hefty fines led school board members to reconsider. It could be as much as $70,000 per unmasked staff member. Do the math, that adds up pretty quick. The state says since the district willfully ignored the mask mandate, they could be fined for every unmasked student as well. The board reinstated that mandate three to two, so students will have to wear a mask now for 13 more school days. The Kettle Falls School District will be closed, though, again today, so staff can regroup. All right, let's talk weather. We had another cold start to the morning, but the sunshine reigns supreme for most of the day. We want to turn things over right to Chief Meteorologist Tom Sherry. A beautiful look up there at, uh, I believe that's silver right behind mm -hmm. you, right? Silver Mountain, yeah, looking good. Uh, you see some fresh snow in the trees. Love that. And we've got more snow we think is going to be falling on uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning. So let's do it. 28 degrees, that's your current temperature. Uh, we are tracking changes in the weather, though. You look at the satellite and radar. Our picture not showing you any rain or snow anywhere across the Pacific Northwest for the weekend. Another very cold night tonight. It drops down to 12 degrees and then we'll look for sunshine. And then for Sunday, it's a mixed bag. Snow in the morning, changing to rain in the afternoon, much warmer with a daytime high of 42. I'm tracking temperatures getting up to 50 degrees next week. I'll track my seven day forecast for you coming up in a few minutes. Good Tom. Thank you very much. 
Well, for days now, Ukrainians have fled their homes to dodge waves of bombs as Russia continues to invade their country. Meanwhile, a WSU athlete from Ukraine is watching her hometown turn to ashes for Pullman. She shared with our Amanda Rowley just how difficult it has been to see these events unfold so far from home. Katarina Maestranko is on the rowing team at Washington State University. She is living across the world from her family who live in the heart of Kiev, Ukraine. Since the invasion, she's been in constant contact with them. Now, she told me it's been tough seeing her home torn apart. Family and friends in Ukraine shared photos of her neighborhood where bombs were dropped. Today, she doesn't even know if her school or her family's apartment is still standing. Her family recently fled from their apartment to their country home about 30 minutes from the city. We have a big basement and the, where they able to take like people there. There's like more than like 40 people right now. So my dad just like opened the door. So some of the kids, they don't have families and some of the uh, just neighbors, they just don't have as uh, big houses. Now, she says her family have been keeping the lights off at night and they have armed themselves with shovels. Now, Katerina is not only worried for her family's safety, but the safety of her friends who are fighting for peace in Ukraine. Many of them are only 18 years old. Meanwhile, she remains positive and hopeful the violence will end and her loved ones will be kept safe. Amanda Rowley, Krem 2 News. All right, Amanda, thank you very much. And Krem 2 is following up tonight after a big development yesterday yesterday in our ongoing investigation into the Spokane shock. The indoor football team lead team officially has no league to play in and nowhere to play games. We have confirmed at this hour the IFL has officially kicked the shock out of the league. Team owner Sam Adams then told us that he will try to join a different league like perhaps the NAL. But today the National Arena League told us they would not entertain an application from Sam Adams. All of this is following our extensive investigation here at Crime 2, which unveiled a history of late payments and defaults from from team owner Sam Adams to the PFD throughout all of last season. The IFL told us based on our investigation, it then opened its own internal investigation into the shock and Adams. The organization tweeted this statement out saying we felt it necessary to move on from the Spokane market and adjust our score, our, our schedule accordingly. Today we also spoke with the director of entertainment at the Spokane Arena. He says the loss of this year's season with the shock is a loss for the entire community. We were all disappointed with how everything was uh, starting to play out, all the information you guys were uh, pulling out with the, uh, to the public. We were trying to do whatever we could to make it work. Um, it's just unfortunately the, the way everything panned out, and especially the, the, the fanatics, right? They're, they're, they don't have something to turn to now. And I, I know they were extremely excited when it was announced back in uh, 2019. Um, and now, it's, uh, now they're just kind of left hanging. They don't have anything to go to. Now today, the arena announced it will start sending out refunds to anyone who bought season tickets or individual game tickets for the 2022 shock season. Any tickets bought through Tickets West will be processed by March 1st, and people should start seeing those refunds reflected on their credit card statements in about seven to 10 business days. Also, as part of our investigation, we uncovered a number of former shock employees who say they're still owed money from their time working for the team. Today, we talked to a former ticket sales manager who says he was never paid, so he turned to the state office of labor and industries. I needed a job because the pandemic took mine away. So I was very excited to, you know, have a job at all. And then of all things for it to be back with the Spokane Shock and back in sports, it was a breath of fresh air, at least I thought. And so you were very surprised then when they called you in and said, it's we're done. Yeah, yeah, I, I couldn't understand it at all because the last thing that I had told my boss is I had sold out all the tickets that I had that he had given me. What was the reason they gave you? <laughs> the reason that he had given me is that he was upset that he had to, you know, roll over at four in the morning and see a text that I had sent him 11 the night before telling him that I had sold out because that day he was going fishing and he didn't like that that, I don't know, irritated his fishing trip. But either way, they didn't end up paying me at the end of it. And that just became a nightmare. So then you t you went to L&I as an effort to try to get your money back. What happened? Yeah, they, they laid a judgment and said that he has to pay me $1,200 in restitution plus interest, which I still have yet to receive that money. And they also, uh, the Spokane Shock, Sam Adams, you know, got a $2,000 fine on top of that. Mm -hmm. So he could have just paid me $1,200, but now he's got $1,200 plus interest plus a fine. 
and I still have yet to get it. When did you decide that you had to take the next step and go to l &I? I mean, I had an email chain where at one point, you know, I laid it out for him because um, he, he just asked me on, on a phone call, like, look, just put it in an email. What do I owe you? And I'll get it to you. So I put it in an email saying, hey, I'm waiving the commission, two weeks, $1,200. That's it. And he responded saying, I bet. Another week went by, I didn't hear anything, I didn't see anything, so then I was like, that's it. And now they don't even have a season to bring in money. And man, I would have loved for everything to go right and be selling Spokane Shock tickets right now. So if you would like to see the entirety of our Spokane Shock investigation, you can go to creme.com right now. You can also just use the keyword shock. Send that to 509-448-2000. We'll send the link directly to your phone. All right, still ahead tonight, a new system to identify how many people are homeless in Spokane County. After the break, the details on that new system and what the city is hoping it can solve.